let's get started. So who am I? I'm Ron Gearlock. I'm a software developer at a company called TokenSoft. We make compliant software for issuers. We take them through uh, the hopefully compliant aspects of their sales, so KYC AML, investor accreditation, and then the processing of funds. Um, and what we're going to go over today is uh, a standard that we're working on, ERC-1404, that's an open standard for enforcing transfer restrictions on tokens. Um, the, I guess, kind of use case on everyone's mind around that is on-chain securities. Um, so I'm going to briefly give some context by introing ERC-20 tokens on Ethereum. This is something probably everyone here is familiar with at this point, but I want to actually look at how the transfer function is implemented. Um, and then I wanted to define what an Ethereum-based security token is and why they might be a big deal. And then uh, lastly, we're going to take a technical look at uh, our standard, ERC-1404, and uh, its implementation. Um, and also discuss just kind of at a high level paths ahead for security token adoption and further standardization. So let's get started. All right, uh, ERC-20, the token standard. Uh, early on in the Ethereum community, it became evident that uh, we needed a way to represent fungible digital assets on chain. And uh, in 2015, a developer Fabian Vogelsteller proposed ERC-20. Um, it's just six functions and two events, uh, but it, it, it could be easily argued that ERC-20 enabled the ICO explosion of 2017, and I think that this is the power of standards, is um, when it's something that a developer community can latch onto and use and run with, you see rapid uh, adoption. Um, all right, so as I mentioned, the interface is just six functions, two events. Uh, we're going to go over those really quickly. First three functions are what we call in Solidity constant functions. That is to say they just read uh, blockchain data. Uh, uh, the first is total supply, uh, which uh, returns the supply of tokens in existence. Um, and this is used often to calculate things like market cap and also record um, uh, minting of new tokens or burning of the token supply. Um, the second function, balance of, takes a single function, uh, an Ethereum address, and it returns the balance of that token owner. Uh, uh, the third is allowance. So uh, one aspect of the standard is the ability to uh, give another Ethereum account or smart contract a spendable amount uh, of tokens that you as the token holder approve them to spend. Uh, why someone would want to do this, I'll explain in a second, but just know that it exists. Um, all right, the next three functions are transfer, approve, and transfer from. So transfer is pretty self-explanatory. It changes the balance of two accounts. Um, this represents a transfer of tokens. Um, and transfer can only be called by the sending account, so the token holder. Uh, um, approve allows an account to set a number of tokens to be transferable by another account, and transfer from Similar to transfer, uh, transfers tokens from one account to another, but it's callable by that approved account. So approve and transfer from are kind of a pair deal. Uh, the reason these exist is so that a smart contract, which doesn't know about transfer events on a token contract, can actually uh, be called to initiate the transfer from, and then that contract can know about uh, or emit an event regarding that transfer. Um, and then the two events, transfer and approval, those are both emitted uh, when tokens are successfully transferred or successfully approved. All right, so just looking at uh, a really sparse um, implementation, uh, this is what uh, construction of a token contract might look like and uh, some of the required variables. Uh, so total supply, it's pretty self-explanatory. This is the total number of tokens often represented as a variable um, it, so that that variable can be changed in the event of minting or burning the token supply. Um, and then uh, a balances mapping, which takes Ethereum addresses, maps them to integers. Uh, this tracks token ownership per Ethereum address. Um, one thing people might ask is, well, what if there isn't uh, ownership represented at an address? Well, in Ethereum, uh, integers default to zero, there is no null, 
Uh, so if an address isn't mapped to uh, a balance greater than zero, it'll just return zero. Um, and then the address is mapping, or allowances mapping, I should say, which tracks spendable token allowances per spender address per token owner address. Um, and in this constructor here, we are assigning the full balance to the address that deployed this ERC-20 contract. This is a common way of minting tokens. Um, moving on. Uh, so here is an actual transfer function implementation. Um, you'll see a check there at the top, require. This is checking that the sender has enough tokens to transfer. Um, and then you see the logic to update the appropriate balances. So we're decrementing the balance of the sender and we're incrementing the balance of the recipient. Uh, we're emitting that successful transfer event and then we're returning true. And an analogy I think is worth giving is that a token contract is like a big spreadsheet of account IDs, Ethereum addresses, and account balances, token amounts, integers. Um, and when we transfer tokens, we're just updating two rows in this spreadsheet. So it's almost uh, deceptively simple. Um, and then uh, there's a lot of patterns that have emerged. Maybe you've seen uh, things like the decimals value, which gives uh, floating point precision to token contracts. You maybe have seen the symbol and name values. These give more like uh, human readable uh, characteristics to a token contract on chain. Um, one of the patterns that's emerged is requiring that the recipient address is not the zero address. What's the zero address? In Ethereum, the zero address is an address that uh, is not, that no transactions are executable from. Um, so if you send tokens to the zero address, um, they're not spendable or sendable ever again. They're effectively burned. Um, but you'll notice that the uh, total supply has not changed in this instance. There's no logic that is updating the total supply. So a lot of people, to not affect the calculation of their market cap, require that tokens can't be transferred to the zero address. And this pattern um, is called a transfer restriction. Um, so I think that this idea of restricting transfers based on certain conditions, this is the basis for thinking behind security tokens. What other sorts of scenarios might restricting a transfer make sense? Could these restrictions be leveraged to enable on-chain compliance? And uh, I, I just want to keep this all in mind going forwards. ERC-20 recap. Um, we have the ability to represent a fungible digital asset on the Ethereum blockchain. We have uh, a minimal inf interface that's relatively simple to, to implement, only six functions and two events. And then uh, we have a standard that's already widely adopted by issuers, wallets, exchanges. Um, so let's get into security tokens. Um, so security tokens, what is the big deal? Uh, if ERC-20 allows us to represent and transfer digital assets, then the blockchain is now this enormous exchange on top of the internet. Um, why might this be a big deal? Well, we now have this 24-7 exchange and a potentially global liquidity pool. Uh, for issuers, Classic exchange listings are no longer necessary for securities to enter the hands of public or private investors. Um, a company could offer equity as tokens on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, but there's a little bit of a problem, and that is that ERC-20 tokens don't have any restrictions on transfers and therefore can be freely traded by anyone. When we're dealing with securities, this is a big no-no. As an issuer, you simply can't afford to allow an unknown person or entity to hold one of your tokens. Essentially, securities are not explicitly fungible assets. There's laws around how they can and should be able to change hands. And what's more, these restrictions depend on how the entity issuing the security is structured. These restrictions could even change in the future. Um, so we can't expect people to play by these rules, and the issuer is held liable if these rules are broken. Is there plausibility? I think so. We could build ERC-20 tokens with extra rules to restrict these unlawful transfers. Um, and we can use the blockchain as a settlement layer with a clear audit trail. And unlike traditional exchanges, the transaction history is now public for everyone. Um, and all this on-chain compliance theoretically saves cost. Uh, with the right approach, we could build a financial system that is lawful by design and even more efficient. Um, so some of the chief concerns regarding the sale and exchange of securities include 
KYC AML. That is know your customer, so knowing who is coming into possession of the security, and AML doing due diligence checks against uh, uh, money laundering lists, so terrorist organizations and the like. Um, and then depending on the investor's jurisdiction, investor accreditation. Uh, as most of these early security tokens are likely going to be private securities. Um, and then also there's uh, issuer specific restrictions. So for instance, the SEC or another statutory body, they could apply limits to say the number of shareholders allowed. All right, so we're getting to ERC 1404. This is the standard being uh, under, it's under active development and promotion at Tokensoft. Um, we introduced it September of this year, and what we're doing is we're seeking to simplify and standardize the handling of these transfer restrictions. Um, so just an overview, uh, Tokensoft, is, oops, Tokensoft is the company behind this, but it is not platform or product specific. We are, um, we're doing this as an open source effort. There are a couple security token platforms out there that use uh, more of a proprietary model and are proposing standards. They're doing good things for the community. Um, but uh, one of the exciting things is because what we're working on sits so low in the hierarchy of concerns of transfer restrictions, we can actually uh, use ERC-1404 underneath something like Polymath's uh, ST20 or Harbor's R token. Um, uh, so one of the one of the downsides of this is uh, it, we leave most of the decisions up to the issuer. This is good or bad depending on your mileage, um, but um, as I'll explain later, it allows for uh, potentially more freedom and composability in constructing your token contract. So um, let's take a look at the ERC-1404 interface. Um, it's really simple. It builds on ERC-20s. It adds just two functions. The first is detect transfer restriction. Um, this takes all the arguments of a transfer function and it simply returns a restriction code. Uh, zero is reserved for success. All other uh, integers are mapped by the issuer to a set of error messages. Um, and that's what message for transfer restriction is for. It's effectively a getter for these error messages based on these restriction codes. So given a restriction code, message for transfer restriction returns a message string describing the transaction. The idea being that this is human readable and people implementing wallets or building out their exchange or just really any interface that deals with transfer restrictions um, can actually call this constant function, detect transfer restriction, get, know that the transaction will fail or not and provide a message as to why it will fail to the, uh, to the potential token sender, even before they waste gas and have their transaction reverted. Um, so we're trying to bring transfer restrictions down to base principles. So let's look at an implementation of ERC-1404. I hope this is visible. Um, what we're doing is we're defining error codes and messages as constants up at the top of the contract. Um, we have our success code, zero, um, we have, uh, we're going to use that uh, zero address uh, restriction as an example here. We have that mapped to one. Um, my hope is that eventually there will be a, a standard error codes that the community can use or point to a library to access, but for now it's up to the issuer. Um, and then we have messages, success and illegal transfer to zero address. It's pretty explicit. Um, so the implementation of detect transfer restriction takes those parameters that you would pass to your transfer function. Um, it, by default, sets the restriction code to the success code, zero, um, but if uh, it sees that you're transferring to the zero address, it sets the restriction code to, uh, to one. Um, and then, uh, also very simply, in message for transfer restriction, uh, we're setting our message by default to the success message. If we see that our restriction code is equal to our zero address restriction code, then we'll return the zero address restriction message. So what do we have to do uh, on the transfer level to make sure that this, is, uh, that this is actually restricting transfers? Well, we overload our transfer and transfer from methods. Um, I'm doing this, uh, I'm, I'm, putting the, uh, I'm putting the restriction logic in a modifier so that I'm not uh, repeating myself. 
but you can see that we're accessing the restriction code, passing it the transfer values. Um, we're requiring that that restriction code is equal to the success code, zero. Um, and if not, the transfer will revert. Um, there will be failure on chain. Uh, but there's a, a path of recourse for someone who sees their transaction fail. They can actually take uh, the parameters that they put into their transfer function. They can feed them to detect transfer restriction, and they can know why their transaction reverted. Um, uh, so that's one of the uh, I've seen in other attempts at a security token standard um, adhering to, I guess, the original idea of ERC-20, which is returning true or false. Um, so not having failure on chain, but uh, forcing, I guess, the user to introspect the transaction itself and seeing the return type of the transfer function. Um, it seems like the community has really adopted reverting transfers, I think for gas cost and for the ability to just know that something failed. Um, so as you can see, ERC-1404 is pretty sparse. It leaves most of the heavy lifting up to the issuer. Um, but I think one of the benefits, as I mentioned before, is this can sit between, uh, beneath other security token patterns. Um, we're working on uh, a, a host of example contracts that uh, can be inherited by the standard implementation of ERC-1404 um, in order to compose uh, like a security token with a bunch of different uh, restriction patterns. Um, uh, let's see, so the idea being that the ERC-1404 standard implementation is this base, these other restrictions are inherited and um, the issuer could create a bespoke security token per terms their legal counsel sets out for them. Um, we want this to be like an open source plug and play system. Um, all right, so security tokens, the path ahead. Uh, I think that security tokens, while very exciting, are still very novel and relatively unadopted technology. Um, but as demonstrated, there's open source initiatives working on standards to try and prime this tech for wider adoption. Um, what are some of the other things that need to happen to move this idea forward? Well, uh, I think most prominent is error code standardization, as I mentioned. Um, so Polymath has put out uh, a security token standard, uh, EAP, ERC 1400, uh, and I think they're actually doing a really good take of this because they're drawing off of an earlier ERC, ERC 1066, which uh, standardizes error codes and includes error codes for things like lockup periods, insufficient balances, uh, sender whitelisting, receiver whitelisting, identity restriction, token restriction, and token granularity, which is like uh, being able to send or not being able to send a, a portion of a token. Um, so I think the other thing is we need greenlit restriction patterns and some sort of established process for these issuers. So like, is using these uh, per jurisdiction whitelists sufficient? What does uh, doing on-chain uh, compliance actually look like in the eyes of regulatory bodies. I think this is mostly a waiting game. We're waiting for these regulatory bodies to speak up um, and hopefully uh, companies, at least at Tokensoft, we try and work with these regulatory bodies to understand what they think of the space and what they think is actually compliance. Um, and so last, if not most obvious, I think uh, exchange volume and listings is going to be the one of the biggest drivers for security token adoption. Um, and this includes decentralized exchanges. So we need to see market demand for these assets. Uh, and I think if these three things come together and we have a strong standard for enforcing transfer restrictions, we can really see security token adoption pick up. Um, and that brings me to the end.